glad to be in your midst tonight. Glad you've taken the time to actually uh, turn your TV on and let it stop right here. We thank you for that. If you like Bible study, you'll enjoy being here because that's what we're going to be studying tonight. <clears throat> we've been studying the, the series on the series we've been doing, uh, a series of questions about why we believe what we believe, particularly examining the Church of Christ. There's a lot of different ideas about the Church of Christ and a whole lot of different misconceptions that are out there. And we're going to deal tonight with a lot of those misconceptions and why there are differences in Churches of Christ, because there are. Uh, one Church of Christ, we have, we have uh, two or three different churches in this, in this town, and uh, there are also different churches in Newton and other areas, and are all of them the same? And the fact is that some of them are. They're all the same. But there's, there are others that there is a marked difference. And what are those differences and why do we, why are we divided in those things? Uh, you see, the, if the Bible is the Word of God, it doesn't matter who departs from it. Then the person who departs from that is going on, Ephesians 5.11, and not walking in the counsel of God. And if they do that, we are not to have fellowship, we're not to have joint participation with them in that if they will not change. And so it's very important that we all, uh, as you look at the Bible, if you have, you have two ways to go, you can consider it authority in your life and the inspired Word of God and God actually talking to you, or you can look at it as just a series of suggestions, uh, uninspired suggestions, and has no authority at all in your life. So if that's the way that you want to look at it, there's two different ways. And in theology, uh, the modern world of theology, there, th those two uh, mindsets are out there. Do we believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God, and is it authoritative in our lives? And that's a very important question to ask and to answer, because it affects the way you live. <clears throat> it affects the way that you, you look at things in this life. And if you have a standard, by which to measure your life, then that standard stays constant. And God's Word is just that. In the Psalm 119 we find all the attributes of the Word of God. Longest chapter in the Bible, and it is talking about the Word of God and the beauty of it from the beginning to the end. We want you to let you know, and we want to welcome you to our program tonight, and we hope you will get your Bible out and that you will follow along with us as we go through our program tonight. If you find us to be teaching or practicing anything that is not a, according to God's Word, please call us and let us know, because 2 John 9 through 11 <clears throat> says that he that goes on and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. And if we bid God speed to those that don't have God, then we are a participator with them in their evil works. So very important that we teach God's Word. You will not be our enemy to point out where we are straying from God's Word. You'll be our friend, and we'll thank you for that, for pointing out where we have erred. Uh, I make mistakes a lot, uh, just not that I intend to, but sometimes I'll call out a passage that is not even, there's not even that many chapters in the, in, in the particular book I'm calling. And you know, you write things down and they don't, uh, for some reason, they don't transfer onto what you're reading. So. Um, again, those catch those and call me, call in. I, I preached a lesson uh, several years ago when I first started preaching. I preached an entire lesson on Moses and the ark. Well, the fact is Moses was not a person that was involved in the building of the ark, nor is he anywhere was he even born at that time. So, <clears throat> fact was the strange thing was that nobody caught it, and that was very embarrassing. And then. Uh, so one person came out and said, did you talk about Moses and the ark? And I said, oh my, I think I did. Listen, listen to the, at that time, the cassette tape, and sure enough, I'd done that. So, you know, thank, and I thank that person for pointing that out. But we need to recognize that. We, uh, we were talking about questions for kids uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we want you to know tonight that we're looking for a man in the Bible who is the only man in the Bible that is mentioned of the household of Israel and in the book, in, in the book of the lineages that is not, his, his father is not listed in his lineage. Uh, and so he was, he was a man in the kingdom of David 
who did not have his father mentioned as a part of his lineage. He had his mother listed, but not his, not his father. And so find that, if you will. And I will tell you, his name begins with a J. And he had an awful lot to do with David and with uh, Saul. So think about that, if you will, and uh, that'll be the section that you'll, that you'll be looking in in the area with uh, David and Saul during the United Kingdom period. <clears throat> so uh, look at that, if you will, and then uh, we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks and get that answer back to you. But we want you to call tonight. We are going to be taking a word and sword religious survey tonight. And we're going to ask you, if you will, if you are in a, if you go to a religious dom denomination or if you go to the Lord's Church, uh, a Church of Christ somewhere, we would like for you to call in tonight and participate in our religious survey. The question is this, and you could be thinking about this, is the church where you are going losing members? And if it is losing members, what would you, what do you attribute that to? What reasons are people giving for leaving the church that you're involved in? If the church is growing where you're, uh, go, where you're um, attending, then please let us know why, what you attribute the growth to. And uh, we're just taking that type of survey tonight, and we're just, it's just our own survey. And uh, the lesson tonight will be dealing particularly with the ideas of liberal theology in, the, in, the, in churches and conservative theology. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a few moments, but the survey is this, the question is this, is the church where you attend losing members, and if it is losing members, why is it losing members in your estimation? And if the church where you are is growing, why is it growing in your estimation? So call in, operators are standing by now at 828-485-5555. And let us know <clears throat> the answers to those questions. You can call in tonight and ask for a free copy of this presentation in hard copy form or in other media form. Ask for a free Bible correspondence course. Again, the Bible correspondence course is used in a lot of places around the world, and it's just a, a, an interesting way to study the Bible and get the basic Bible foundation that you need. So if you would uh, call in for that, it's for everything we offer here is free of charge. We do not want you to send money, as those of you who have been watching the program well know. We don't want, we don't solicit funds from people. We don't sell prayer claws. We don't sell um, paraphernalia that'll make you rich. Uh, that's just not found in the Bible, and we don't do it anyway. And plus, we finance our own work. And this is uh, everything we offer is free, and uh, particularly if you have the question about a Bible subject. We have several different tracks we can send you on that, which is a printed sermon. Or we have, uh, in some cases, we have some uh, DVDs that we could send you on the particular subject. So if you would like to do that, if you would like to call in and uh, hear something about a particular Bible subject, please let us know. And depending on the subject, the media form we send to you may be different. So we will absolutely, we're all about answering Bible questions. You can call and ask for a map to the building or the address will be given as the show progresses. And you can ask to be added to our bulletin mailing list, which is The Beacon. And uh, it goes out quarterly. And uh, it is a monthly publication, but it goes out quarterly. And we will be glad to mail that to you free of charge. Or sign you up for the correspondence course. You can either take it online or we will mail it to you free of charge. You, you can also get a number of Bible study aids by going to our website, which is Word and Sword, uh, www.wordandsword.com. That would be www.wordandsword.com. And notice there that you spell out and. Uh, you can post a question up there if you would like. You can call with a, uh, tonight with a biblical question on, on the air, and we are entertaining questions on the air. The operators will take those down. If you would like to come on the air uh, during the program and be live with us, the operators are screening calls too, and they will be glad to put you back, put you on the air, and we will interrupt our, our uh, broadcast for your question. It's that important. <clears throat> so uh, we ask you to be courteous, and we will be courteous also in uh, the answers to your questions. 
Uh, we will do our best to give you a book, chapter, and verse answer. And if we do not know the answer, we'll tell you, I don't know right now. But we will find out, and we will get back with you. If you will get, leave us your information to do that, we'll get, make, be very glad to do that. You can like us on Facebook also. Two Facebook sites, www.facebook.com slash word and sword or www.facebook.com slash Newton, North Carolina, Church of Christ. And also you can follow us on Twitter at Word and Sword and uh, you can post Bible questions up on both of those sites and uh, we will be glad to have a discussion with you about any Bible question that you have. And we do thank you. People have questions about the Bible. There's no need to go around with a question that you don't have an answer for. If there is an answer in the Bible, we will find it and get it to you. If there is no answer in the Bible, God does not want us to know the answer to it. There are some, some questions about, you know, that are, that are questions you can't answer. Uh, did, na did Adam have a navel? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, you know, uh, who, who did Adam's kids marry? Well, obviously he married some relatives for a while. Uh, that's what the Bible teaches, but as far as knowing that for a fact, I don't know. But the things that we can know that God has revealed, Deuteronomy 29, 29, revealed things belong to us. Secret things belong to God. And God does have things that are just in His purview of the wheelhouse of knowledge that He has not chosen to reveal to us. And we just have to be satisfied with that. Someone said years ago that um, the job of a, of a person who is a Bible believer is not to make you leap with your step of faith, but to give you every evidence that makes you believe that when you leap, you will be making the right choice. There is a point beyond which no one can prove some things. If so, faith would be all by sight, and there would be no reason for faith. But faith is important. Faith is built through a study of God's Word. Faith is built by realizing that the stories of the Bible are not fictitious, they're not legends, they're not myths, they are facts. And the more we look at archaeology and the things of archaeology and the things of, of uh, literature, we see that there is so much proof for the things of the Bible. There are about 12 copies that exist for the, for the uh, records and the, the uh, information we have about Plato and about Seneca and other prof prophets of the time, other uh, philosophers of the time of the New Testament. And we don't have any problem accepting those. Shakespeare's works have under 10 copies of the original, but yet we accept those, don't we? We accept those as William Shakespeare wrote these things. And the majority of the world accepts that without question. But it seems that when we come to the Bible, where there are thousands of records of the things that are mentioned in the Bible, thousands, and there are documents that prove that what was said is absolutely true. An entire copy of the book of Isaiah found in 1949 in Qumran over in Israel in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it was no different, and you can view it today in the Israeli Museum, and I've seen it, and you can view it, and it is exactly what we have in the text of Isaiah and have always had in that text today, thousands of years old. And it is absolutely word for word what we have today. In uh, our translation, of course, translations are different, uh, but the Hebrew is exactly what it was and what it was translated from years ago without that copy. So all that did was verify that what we had believed for years was absolutely more verified. So again, the job of a person that is trying to build faith in people is to tell them what the evidence is. No one can make you accept the evidence. You either accept that by faith and by reason and by logic, or you reject it. But I'll tell you, if you reject, there are consequences because the Word of God will be the book upon which we will be judged on the last day. Believe it or don't believe it, that's your choice. You have a right to do that in our country. But if you choose not to believe it, there are consequences. If you choose to believe it, there are tremendous joys that await you. But you must have faith. 
in order to believe the things of God. Everything that you want to believe will, cannot be proven to your satisfaction sometimes. But what is necessary for you to go to heaven can be proven, and you must accept it if you want to go to heaven. Well, we have an event that's going to be taking place at the Newton Church of Christ uh, from June the 14th through the 16th, and it is a gospel meeting. That's what we call them as a gospel meeting. Many of you might call this a revival, but it is a weekend series of preaching with uh, Brother Alex Caldwell, who is from Pine Bluff, Arkansas area. And uh, we are going to be meeting at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina, 28658. The phone number for the, at the building. If you need a ride, please call and leave a message. We'll make sure we get you there and we'll get you home at 828-465-3009. Or you can contact us by email at wordandsword.com. The topics for the week are going to be Friday night. Brother Caldwell will speak to us much about what we're speaking about on this program tonight at the beginning here, about uh, particular things that divide the church of Christ. There are divisions that take place in the Lord's church. <clears throat> Um, that's how we got to where we are with denominations in church history. If you look at the, uh, the timeline of the Reformation and the timeline of the Restoration Movement, departures from the faith were active during the time of the New Testament. They were working even then. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, he says, I marvel, or Galatians 1, 6, I'm sorry, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto a different gospel, which is not another gospel. But there be some who would trouble you. He follows that with verses 8 through 10, where he says, Though we are an angel from heaven, preaching to you any other gospel than what you have received, let him be accursed. So we have to follow the things of God and do the things of God like God says. And everything that seems good to us is not necessarily something God wants the church involved in. Everything that is good and everything that is right to do, God has made a venue in which to operate and to do those things. He has given charges to the home. He's given charges to the, to the political world. He's given charges to the church on the things that they should do. And our society has certain rules and boundaries upon which we're to live. On Saturday night, we're going to be, uh, Brother Caldwell will be preaching about loyalty and how important it is to be loyal to the Lord. That's continuing in our faithfulness. On Sunday morning in the Bible study period, he'll be talking about the value of attendance at, at worship services. Why it's important. Why, why, do you, why do people go to church? You know, we talk about that. Well, the fact is, you really can't go to church, the church is the people. But we know what we mean by that when we say go to the assembly or we're going down to the church building to worship with the people. On Sunday morning at the worship period time after our Bible classes, uh, the lesson that he will present to us and his final lesson he'll present in this series will be, we are so unworthy. And what a wonderful statement that indicates how the, the grace and the mercy of God is bestowed upon us even though we don't deserve it. But God is willing to be able to, to keep his promise, to if we if we do what we've to, to do according to his will and love him and keep his commandments, that we will be able to be saved and be with him one day, and redeemed in glory. So come and be with us during this during this weekend, July the 14th through the 16th, and you'll be a most welcome guest. We appreciate so much if you would come, and if you do not have a ride. If you need transportation, call the number 828-465-3009. No one's there, leave a message and we will be sure to get back with you and make arrangements to not only pick you up, but take you home. And uh, we will, again, appreciate the opportunity to do that. Well, again, we want to make, make sure that you know the plan of salvation. What is the most important thing that you need to consider in your life? It's not how, how good your 401k is doing now. It's not how much you'll have when you retire. Because none of us are promised a retirement, are we? We make arrangements for it. But you know, we may not ever have to get to enjoy anything we put aside. So what's the most important question anyone could ask? What do I need to do to be saved? 
Am I saved? Like the Bible says, am I saved as the Bible teaches? Again, looking at the things that God says, that Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 48, God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. We know in Romans 10 that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. In John 8, 24, unless we believe that He is, we will all die in our sins. And Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, if we don't repent, we will perish. In Matthew 10, verse 32, if we confess Jesus to men, He will confess us before His Father. In Mark 16, 16, Jesus teaches, He that believes and is ba pardon me, baptized shall be saved, and he that disbelieves shall be condemned. And then in Matthew 24 and verse 13, we have to hear these words and do them. And if we have done what He tells us to do, we'll be considered faithful and we will be able to be with Him forever. So you see, it's important not only that we be obedient to the Gospel, and we are baptized into Christ, by, and the blood of Christ saves us as we are uh, access it in baptism, but also that we remain faithful. Revelation 2.10, be faithful unto death, and you'll receive the crown of life. A faithful life of service is absolutely essential to go to heaven. Have you done these things, friends? Have you been obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ? These are the most important words that you could, uh, applications of God's word that you could ever put into practice. These are the things that make you a new child of God. Whatever you have done in the sin realm will be washed away by the blood of Jesus as in the waters of baptism as you come humbly. Having heard the word of God, you believe it with all your heart, you repent of your sins, change your life, Confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and be baptized in water for the remission of your sins, and put Christ on in baptism, Galatians 3 and verse 27. <coughs> I'm having a little bit of allergy problems, and I apologize to you for that. I will try to shadow the microphone where I don't blow your speakers, so um, I apologize in advance for that. Well, the question tonight before us, and again, remember, we're taking a survey. It's a Word and Sword Bible survey, so call in to our operators tonight. The number is at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be scrolling as we go through our, our lesson tonight. Why are we different from other churches of Christ? What's the difference, for instance, in the Newton Church of Christ and in the Hickory Church of Christ? What's the difference in the Newton Church of Christ that meets at St. James Church Road and the Oak Church of Christ, which meets two blocks over. What's the difference? Why are we different from other churches? What is the difference? The number is there, 828-465-5555. Operators are standing by. Why are we different? You see, we have done a lot of examining of other groups as we've gone through our surveys and as we've gone through our studies. So what is the difference? Come back to me, if you will. What is the difference now? What's the difference? Is there a difference? In, have, are all churches of Christ what God wants them to be? Are churches of Christ capable of falling away from what God wants them to be? When does digression start? Well, you know, if I had a, a blackboard up here, or if I had some type of illustration that I could show you, we, we, we could draw a line. Just let me use this piece of paper right here. And I will draw a line right here, okay? Now this is going to be a straight line, okay? All right? Now when I, if I were to draw another line that would be kind of a 40, about a, well, I don't know what type of angle it would be. But anyway, where would the, the point of digression come from? When would I start digressing from the straight line and begin to get away from what the straight line is. Let's say the straight line is the pattern of what is right. And the other line that begins very gradually to depart from that straight line. At what point have I departed from the right way? Well, you see, we all know when, when that would begin, wouldn't we? We know enough about when something begins to go away from something is right at the point of of the division, when you depart from it. And it may not be very recognizable when you begin to do it. But drifting is how digression starts. 
and in every error that has ever been involved with the church. Whatever Satan puts up there for us, he understands that in trying to lead people away from God, <clears throat> that he has to do it gradually in many cases. And he's very good at that. So he will take good people and he'll quote the, he'll quote the Scripture to them. And he'll make them think that it doesn't matter how you interpret the Scripture, just so you quote Scripture. Because we're all in the Bible, right, when we're quoting Scripture. But you see, it, you have to quote the Scripture in the context in which God gave it. Uh, digression starts very gradually, but it is nonetheless digression. And so we have to be very careful about making sure we hold fast to the old paths, as the Old Testament writer said, wherein is the right way. So are we doing that? It is a constant battle. It is an every generation battle. It is a daily battle in our own lives and certainly in the life of our, our relationship in the church. Why did churches of Christ begin to depart? If you're turning your Bible to the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, you see seven churches that are talked about in the first century. Five of them are at the point of being so far away from God that God is ready and Christ is ready to remove His candlestick from them. That's figurative language for saying that Christ is ready to say, you don't belong to me anymore. Now these are churches that started out very well. They started out faithful. But Satan was very active with the faithful. He is active today. Did you know Satan goes to church? He does. He's right there in the midst. Not only is Christ in the midst, but Satan comes. You ever been sitting at church services and your mind begins to wander? And you're not focusing on the things of God, but you're focusing on your new boat or that fish that you didn't catch yesterday or something like that. You know what that is? That's you allowing yourself to be drifting off when you should be focusing and concentrating on the things of God. You're doing other things. Well, as long as you're doing other things, you're not thinking about the things of God and how you can apply what's being said from the Scripture to your life. And it's just that subtle. And then there will be people that will excuse those types of sins and says, well, it's not really that bad. Well, what that does is it leads us away from intensive Bible study. And so when we get away from studying the Bible, we don't know the problems and the weapons of Satan. And so we're not armed. Just like when you go out uh, and walk through a dark street at night and it's dangerous, it's perilous unless you know where not to go, you see. And so we need to see the signposts of danger and be able to avoid them. In Psalm 1, notice what it says there, Blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He doesn't stand in the path of sinners, and he doesn't sit in the seat of the scoffer. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and what's this? In that law he meditates day and night. As a result, he'll be stable. He'll be like a tree planted by the river of water, brings forth his fruit in season, and his leaf shall never wither. A solid, wonderful tree, active and putting forth fruit. That's what the righteous will be. But the ungodly are not this way. They're like the wind or the chaff that the wind drives away. And they won't stand when the times get hard. So what that says is that we can drift away very quickly when we get away from the things that stabilize us and that give us the evidence that we need. When you go on a trip somewhere, let's say you're going on a vacation and that's it's vacation time, do you plan at all? Or do you just get in the car and say, okay, let's go? Well, some people just get in the car and say, well, let's just drive till we find somewhere. That's not a bad idea in vacations, but it's an awful bad idea when it comes to religion. You don't just jump out there and say, well, I'm gonna be religious. Well, what are you going to do? Well, you need to look and see what the Bible says if you're going to put your energy into it, right? Because you certainly don't want to put the energy into living for God if you don't know what God wants you to do, okay? So that's very important that we at least research a little bit about what God's Word says. What am I looking for? What is the attraction of the Bible? And what is the attraction of God's Word? What is the church of the New Testament? We've talked about that. 
Well, the fact is in those five churches in Revelation chapter 2, what happened was those five churches, if they did not correct themselves, they lost their identity as the people of God. When does that happen? I don't know all the things about that. But I do know there comes a point at which God will cease to recognize even His people as His people anymore. We did that with Israel. He rejected them, although He called them out to be His separate people. But they didn't want to be His separate people. They wanted to be like the world. And so God divorced them. God put them aside. God said, no, you have been spiritually unfaithful to me, and I will not own you anymore. That's a bad place to be, folks. Well, in church history, we have seen, as we've studied on this program through the years, we've seen how digression has taken place in history. Digression started taking place in the time of the first century. About 150, there were doctrines that came up, like the infant baptism and other things along those lines, that were even beginning to happen even then. The Scriptures talk about that in Galatians 6, 1, also in 1 Timothy, also in Acts 20 and verse 28, where the Ephesian elders are told that even from among them own, their own selves, people would arise teaching perverse doctrines and leading away disciples after themselves. Peter talks about how to, how to recognize false teaching and to know that there would be those out there that would be doing that, and it would come from within. So what that says is the chosen people of God will teach others to depart from the faith. Be careful what you just take and say, that's, that's it. I want to read to you one of the things that has divided the Church of Christ over the years. Uh, and have you ever heard of the um, International Church of Christ? the ICOC. Well, it's active in the Charlotte area, and I've met some of them. And it is related to a movement several years ago that was called the Crossroads Movement. And there's been some divisions among them, and uh, they, they got into a group called the Boston Street Movement. And then they got into what's called the International Church of Christ. Well, because of the activities of the, of the IOC, uh, we find IOCC, we find that what's happened is that many have equated the Church of Christ with the International Church of Christ. The doctrine that is taught is very similar. They teach baptism for remission of sins. They teach that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. But the way in which they teach it is cultish, and the expectations they have. And they have a, a, a type of thing that they use called heavy shepherding. Now the Bible certainly teaches that shepherds are absolutely a part of the work of the New Testament church. But the shepherds are not to be domineering dictators. They are to be humble servants. And they are to be open to criticism and easily um, entreated. They are to be able to be reasoned with. But in the IOC, uh, the heavy shepherding is a psychological control issue that many cults use. It is, again, a way that they control the mind. And many people think that that's what the Newton Church of Christ is. When they hear the term Church of Christ, they say, oh no, you don't want to get into that cult. And certainly these are cultish practices that take place in people calling themselves the Church of Christ. But just because you call yourself the Lord's Church does not mean that you have all the identifying characteristics of it. I am similar to a horse in that I have eyes and a horse has eyes. I have ears and a horse has ears. But you can see very clearly, and I hope you'll be kind, that I am not a horse. Okay? We have similarities but they don't follow all the way down. I have two legs, a horse has four. So there's a distinction, you see. We are all, we were both mammals, but every, we're, we're not alike in every way, right? How do you know whether, I, whether I'm not a horse? You have to compare me to a horse, don't you? How do we know someone is not the true church of Christ? We compare what they're doing and practicing with what the Bible teaches. That's how we know. And we see the, the, the Church of Christ remembered in the Bible. 
Now, on some of the things and how this heavy shepherding exemplifies itself is in these groups, the IOCC, they ask their members to be, to be submissive to what they call discipleship partners or shepherds and that their authority is absolutely the top thing. Not the authority of Scripture, but what these people tell you to do is what you must do because you're a newbie and you don't know really all the strings. And so they're going to make sure you know everything you're supposed to know without question. Also, you have an obligation to confess your sins to this discipleship partner or shepherd. Not, a, not confess them to God, but confess specifically what you have done, what your thoughts have been to a particular person. They also demand unquestionable loyalty and obedience to their authority. They also say that you are obligated to recruit others, and they give you a quota to do that. The authoritative leadership and the group experience is absolutely important, and they mainly center themselves, and watch this when you send your kids to college, they mainly center themselves around first-year college students who are looking for a place of belonging, who are looking for friends, and they seize upon that vulnerability. Spiritual manipulation and intimidation, conformity to the movement standards, a hierarchy system of accountability, not the Scriptures, but to them, and also control over the members. Prohibition against reading any literature that is not approved by them. And also whistleblowing on members that are suspected of being nonconformist to the authority of the shepherd. Sound familiar? See? Is that in the Bible? Do you find any of the apostles leading that way? Do you find any of the churches being led by elders that were that way? You don't. Now, are there some aspects of this that are biblical? Absolutely. Authority is absolutely biblical. Unquestioned authority, but it comes from God, not from people. See? Well, total dependence on the movement and the leaders for approval of what you do, and fear of punishment and humiliation if you question them and their leadership. Now, friends, anyone that is not open to questions, is, that's a sure sign that you need to get out. If you can't ask questions, honest questions of people. I was trying to teach a person that came out of, that was, that was had called the TV program, actually, from over at Mooresville one night. And we met with her and tried to study with her. And as soon as we got very far along, she started bringing her discipleship partner with her. And it wasn't long before our study was done. And she was not allowed to come anymore. And she called us and told us that. And I met with a, a gentleman that was in the leadership in this movement in Charlotte. And he would not tell me what religious group he was with for a long, long time. And I sort of knew who he was and what he was doing. But ended up that he finally told me who he was and what he was all about. But it was after almost two and a half hours of very persuasive and very friendly conversation where he was trying to get me to commit and agree with the things that he had taught. And what his purpose was, was to try to steal away people who had been in the religious organizations in different, different groups. Well, he found out very quickly that I knew, I knew what he was about, and we've had no more conversation since then. But he was watching the t program. Now, again, he may be watching tonight. If he is, call me and tell me if I'm wrong, okay? But any leader who demands blind obedience to what he says without a question from anyone, and that no authority, he is not bound to give you Bible authority for what he says, don't follow them. Don't follow them. Doesn't matter who they are. In the Church of Christ or out of the Church of Christ, do not follow a person that does that. 
That is not the way of God. And it doesn't matter whether somebody has the name Church of Christ in their, on their card or anything like that, because again, you can call yourself something. And that doesn't mean you're the real deal. So that's very important. Well, as we go on and look at what makes, uh, what are the differences in the Church of Christ, there are a number of differences that exist in different churches. Over the years, there have been a number of divisions that have occurred. We in the body of Christ uh, are born into the same family when we are baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. But any one of us can, come, can become a prodigal or a disobedient child. Many Christians do not all believe the same things as we are instructed to do in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. All speak the same things. They are, we are not all united in our belief. Any one of us can depart from the faith. And there are some who go undetected in that, and there are those who are detected in that. When we know someone has departed the faith and is not living faithfully to God, we are charged by God with withdrawing ourselves from them and having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Many Christians do not all teach the same things as is told and Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and also chapter 3. Many, many people in the body of Christ will follow their leaders just like denominational people will and will not question and will not look for Bible proof for the way they're going. They'll just up and just do something and then tr after the fact try to find some type of authority for it or passage here or there. Many Christians don't all practice the same things. Many Christians in the body of Christ are walking in error when it comes to modesty, when it comes to dancing or gambling or drinking in their own personal lives. And so there are differences that exist among brethren that the church itself does not stand for and the, and the scriptures teach that we are to teach against. Notice some of the challenges that exist in churches of Christ today. The divorce remarriage issue, where Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9 and Matthew 5.32, Romans chapter 7 and 1 Corinthians chapter 7 all address marriage. And marriage is permanent. Marriage is to be forever, one man and one woman for life. That's what the Bible says. As long as they both shall live, Romans chapter 7. But when a person dies in, from a marriage relationship, the person that is the survivor in that marriage relationship is called a widow or a widower, and they have a right to remarry. Also, if an unfortunate circumstance occurs in a marriage where one of the partners is involved in fornication, that is sexual unfaithfulness while you're married, adultery. Well, if that occurs, the innocent party in that can scripturally divorce their spouse and can use the laws of the land to do so. But, and they would have a right, the innocent party would have a right to remarry. The guilty party, however, according to the scriptures, friends, would not ever have a right to remarry. Okay? Now, there are divisions in the body of Christ over the social gospel. The social gospel is that which says that we are to appeal to people based upon gimmicks. Uh, we have coffee and donuts for people so they'll come. We have um, programs for the kids. We have gymnasiums. We have youth groups. We have schools that are sponsored by the Lord's Church. And this is all a part of the social gospel concept of reaching the lost. People uh, use the phrase missions today where they have a doctor's mission or a, a uh, band mission or something like that. Well, the Bible doesn't speak of such things. Ball teams, they are not in the Bible. No one appealed to people, Jesus, nor any of the apostles, nor the, anybody in the New Testament church, appealed to people by getting them to follow some social gimmick and then uh, throwing in a little Jesus on the side. Well, church recreation, where the church sponsors recreational activities for the kids, camps and things like that, where that comes out of the funds. Now, are camps okay for kids to go to? Absolutely they are. 
They should be around in camps where kids are religious. Yes, where the Bible's taught. Nothing wrong with that. Individual Christians can get together and can agree to get together and sponsor those things for kids. That's certainly an individual obligation, but nowhere in the New Testament do you find the New Testament church financing such things out of the treasury of the New Testament church. And that's caused a lot of division. The question has not been, is, is recreation good for a child or good for any of us? That's not a question. The question is not, do Christians need to be social? We do. Or whether people need to be married. The Bible teaches and, and sanctions marriage. You don't have to be married to go to heaven. But if you do, there's rules about it. Well, what about the organization of the church? Well, this is where the first digressions in the church started taking place. Uh, you had elders in each congregation. Each congregation an autonomous unit. But very quickly in the first century, we got to the point where in six, the 606, Boniface III stood up and said, I am the Christ lone vicar on this earth. I am the universal pope. Well, the digressions have been happening many years before that, gradually, but it became full-blown. Again, the way in which this happened was you had a, a political system that happened to the church. You had a head elder in a local congregation, and then you had a, an elder that said, well, you know what? We're more qualified than these guys, so we're going to oversee those guys. So the oversight of a local congregation changed to the oversight of three or four of those, where you had a metropolitan and one man in the city, and then it ended up being someone who was called a bishop over a particular area. And then you had archbishops, and then next thing you know from the archbishops and the hierarchy, people began to jockey in politic for who could be the, the greatest. You remember how Jesus condemned that among His disciples? He said, He will be greatest among you, let him become your servant. That's what he said. But no, Boniface III said, I am going to be the one that runs the church. I'm it. And Christ works through me. Well, from that, we had Roman Catholicism, full blown. Full blown. Now, that's how things happen, but in the New Testament church today, that's still going on. You still have that where one congregation wants to oversee the activities of other congregations. There are some congregations that exist even in this area where they are under the oversight of a particular congregation somewhere even across the country that built their building and paid for everything they have and they are under the oversight not of people in their midst but of people miles away from them. That's not biblical, folks, and when that happens, we cannot have fellowship, Ephesians 5.11, with that particular unfruitful work of darkness, because it leads to more works of darkness. Again, remember, this organizational problem did not happen all of a sudden. The work of the church, what is the work of the church? It's threefold, it's very simple, evangelism, edification, and benevolence. And the benevolence is limited. Can the church take care of its own needy? Can each local congregation do that? Yes. But what if a congregation has needs far and above what they're able to supply? Other congregations can help. But there is no need for an outside organization to be funded and built on a sustaining basis to do that. If you had, el if you had orphans in your congregation, you could buy services to take care of them. And you can adopt them into your own homes individually. But understand that these things are, are things that would have to be worked out in the local congregations. You wouldn't go over to California and say, what can we do? Oversight would be on the local congregational level. So the work of the church is evangelism, that's teaching and spreading the gospel in the communities where we are edification, that is spiritual edification and spiritual fellowship, that's to be done in the local congregation. And also we see there that that can sometimes lend itself as we as individuals support gospel meetings in an area or whatever. Well, what about preaching? There's been divisions in the body of Christ and there continue to be over preachers. 
and what they teach? And can you use a preacher that teaches error in your pulpit as long as he doesn't teach that error while he's there? Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? As long as he be qu is quiet about it. Well, let me ask you something. If the man comes to a situation where he is called upon to teach what he believes, do you think he's going to do that? Yes. And a lot of errors start not publicly, but they start privately. And that's why we have to be careful. Now, is everyone going to agree with everybody on every scruple that's out there? No. No. And the Lord doesn't ask us to. Some may want to eat meat, some may not want to eat meat. Some want to keep a day, some don't want to keep a day, Romans 14. And so there can be authorized authority for all those practices. But again, let each be make their decision based upon a conviction, not upon a whim. Well, these things that we have up here on this wheel and this illustration are the things that have divided brethren over the years. And there are others, okay? There are many others. We could just have the wheel full of spokes if we wanted to, because there is no end to what Satan can throw up to divide people that want to go to heaven. So how do we determine what is authorized? Well, we go to the Bible, because you know the early church had things that divided it. Notice you had a lot of Christians that were coming from Jewish backgrounds in the New Testament. And then you had the inclusion of the Gentiles, which the Christians seemed to be happy with, Jewish Christians, but at the same time, they had some problems about it. In the first century, the Jews were bound to keep the law before Jesus died on the cross. They were bound to keep the law of circumcision. That was given to Abraham. And it was something that marked them as Jews. Well, there are many Christians in Acts 15 that had no problem with the Gentiles being Christians, but they wanted them to be circumcised first. See? And so we see Acts 15, they meet together and they see what the Holy Spirit has said. By direct statement, by approved apostolic examples, and by necessary inference, they approved what needed to be done. What was the conclusion? Circumcision is not bound on Christians. Peter gets up and he speaks, James speaks, Paul and Barnabas speak. And Paul and Barnabas give the example of them teaching the Gentiles and not binding circumcision on them. And that's an apostolic example, the Holy Spirit guiding them in that. And then there's the direct statement that James talks about. And then there's the inference that Peter gives us, where we see there that Peter says, why would we bind on people? matter of convenience or a matter of sanitary things or whatever that might be, that's up to you. But you cannot make it a condition of whether somebody is a Christian or not. The Bible disallowed that. And this was dividing the church. But look how quickly the Holy Spirit handled it through His Word. And the solution was, let's go back to what the text says. What does God want us to do? Well, again, in the Lord's Supper. How do we know about the Lord's Supper to partake of it every first day of the week? Well, the direct command in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24, there's a direct statement on the observance of it. When you come together, he says you don't come together for the good, there's divisions among you, but don't do that, he says. The Lord's Supper needs to be partaken in the way that Christ instituted it. The proper observance of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine every first day of the week. Now how do we find out the time of the observance? We go to Acts 20 and verse 7 and we see the approved example. They met together to break bread on the first day of the week. And then we look at the frequency of it. The necessary inference is every first day of the week because it's the same language structure in Greek that it is in Hebrew in Exodus chapter 20. And we see that remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Which Sabbath day did a Jew keep? Every one that came, didn't he? Does it say, remember every Sabbath day that comes? It does not. The commandment said, remember the Sabbath day, and the Jew knew every one of them that came. By inference. 
And so it is in Acts 20 and verse 7. On the first day of the week, the disciples met together to break bread. What did they do on the first day of the week? Every week, they met together to break bread. And we do the same thing. We follow the pattern. The scriptures teach it. Now, why don't we have, why, why do we have problems with people that don't do that? Not because we just want to be hard to get along with and irritable, but because the Bible authorizes us not to do anything that is not according to the pattern that God said in the scripture. Early divisions that occurred in the 1800s in this country, in the 1849, there was a division over the Missionary Society. There was division over instrumental music in the Church of Christ in 1859, and one continues today in different churches of Christ today. The real issue in all of these things was authority. The result was when somebody departs from the authority of God, they cause a division. Now notice it is not the ones that hold to the authority of God that cause the division. It is those who want to bolt from the authority of God. Those that want to wander from the authority of God. Who will cause the division? Now, the realistic thing here, folks, is that when somebody departs from God, they don't ever want to admit it, that it was them that caused the problem. They're going to point to you. And it is interesting that Satan uses that tool because he gets right-thinking people to start feeling guilty about thinking right. Isn't that something? But that's exactly what happens. And then you get brethren turning on one another that even agree on the right things because they don't like the way in which the disagreement was handled or they don't like this or they don't like that. And so what you have is a division that occurs. Now there are some that are necessary and there's a whole lot of them that aren't. I tell you some of the things brethren fuss about today and get all torqued out with one another over are absolutely offensive to God. He wants his people to be united. And we're not going to be united on every little nuance and every agreement of how we ought to do this or ought to do that. But we have to ask ourselves a question when we have disagreements on matters of judgment. Is the thing that was done wrong? And if it was not wrong, then it's going to be open to some judgments on that. And we have to respect one another's judgments. When we have division in the body of Christ, let's make sure that it is on matters of doctrine and not matters of judgment. Okay? Because anything that is not a matter of doctrine is a matter of judgment, and we all have one. Well, what, did, what resulted when we had these divisions on the missionary society and the instrumental music issue was what came from that was the Christian churches. Uh, the church called the Christian church came from those types of divisions with the, uh, the faithful body of Christ. Well, some said, well, we can evangelize by setting up Christian missionary societies and churches sending their money to them to do the work. Well, the Bible doesn't authorize churches sending money to human organizations to do their work for them. The church does not authorize instrumental music. The Bible doesn't authorize instrumental music. The Bible doesn't authorize missionary societies. Each local congregation does its work of evangelization. And we don't turn that over to somebody else. Instrumental music is not found in the scripture. And when people introduce that, they are introducing a doctrine of, the, of men, not a doctrine of Christ. Now from the Christian church, the Christian church had divisions. And from that came the disciples of Christ. Now the things that at the beginning were agreed upon was the essentiality of baptism. That didn't change for many years. The authority of the Bible, that didn't change for many years. But their application of those things did change. And so what we have today is the Christian church is again involved in divisions and they have digressed very, very far away from the pattern of the scripture to where there is not even a distant relationship that can exist with the true church and the Christian church. The disciples of Christ the same way. My father and my grandmother and my grandfather 
were involved in those types of divisions and they came away on the, on the, on the scriptural side with those things. But they lost many friends over these things. And my great grandfather was involved in some of that right after some of these things started. He was born in 1875 and the church was involved in eastern North Carolina with that. Matter of fact, a church that is now the Christian church when my grandfather was a deacon there was called the Church of Christ. And it was for many years. Well, again, what happened? At some point, the Lord removed his candlestick and he had nothing to do with them anymore. But what about churches of Christ today? Again, the, the, this is usually called in church history the Stone Campbell uh, movement. Well, many people say that the New Testament church, the Church of Christ, began with Thomas Campbell and Alexander Campbell. No. The New Testament church started in Acts chapter 2 in about 33 AD. Now Campbell and others called for a renewal of coming back to the Bible for authority. But after 1849 and 1859 we find divisions even started very quickly after those divisions took place. In the 1950s and 60s and we're getting into the era where I was alive and I remember some of this some of the divisions that occurred in the body of Christ, I don't remember 1900 to 1930, but orphans' homes were formed. Potter Orphans' Home and others were formed, and no one was against taking care of orphans. Remember, the Lord authorizes to take care of the fatherless and the widows. Individuals are told to do that in James 1.27. And the New Testament church is to make sure, Acts chapter 6, in the local congregations that those who need things, need benevolence, are taken care of, of their own members, okay, in the local church. What's the broadest group there is where there is authority for it to act is the New Testament church locally. Every local autonomous congregation takes care of its own needy. Well, somebody says, well, suppose somebody's not a Christian. You don't think the Lord understood that there might be those types of situations? He did. And in his wisdom, he said the individual takes care of that. Galatians 6 and verse 10, he says, he says you be, be benevolent to all men, especially those of the household of faith. But he's talking in the context of Galatians 6 to individuals. The application is to the individual. It's not a charge to the church to take care of the needy of the world. It's the job of the individual Christian. Somebody says, what difference does that make? It makes all the difference because if God authorized the individual to do it, that's it. The same difference as it makes when the Lord says, husbands love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Does it make a difference which, which man a woman loves? It does. Because there are many husbands in the body of Christ, does that mean a woman has to love all of them? No, we know better than that, don't we? Well, the, the Lord authorizes the, uh, the governments of men. Does that mean that everything that I want done has to work through the governments of men? No. Again, everything that is good to do, God has given a venue in which it is to be done. James 1.27, visit the fathers and widows in their afflictions and keep yourself unspotted from the world. That's talking to individuals. So Christians need to take care out of their own pocket, not out of the treasury, the needy of the world. And we don't need to be so close-fisted about it and so tight. We don't need to call a meeting when somebody says, I need a sandwich. Go buy them one out of your pocket if you can. Or take them to your house and fix them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That'll take care of it. What have you done? You've taken care of the need. And if there's anything else that you can do legitimately, then do so. But don't call a meeting of the church to feed every person that needs a sandwich. Well, suppose you have a brother or sister that needs a sandwich. Still, if you can provide that out of your, out of your funds yourself, why not do that? But if no one in the church has a loaf of bread and doesn't have any peanut butter, then you can collectively use the treasury to do that for your members. 
Well, some things, even with individuals, are charged by God, 1 Timothy. A widow indeed is to be taken into the charge of the church, but he gives specific qualifications for a widow indeed. Okay? Not every widow. Individuals take care of people that they see have a need, especially those of the household of faith. Well, in the 30s, a big push went, came down. In the 40s, renewed interest in orphan homes, primarily because men were going overseas and a lot of orphans were left after World War II. And the soldiers were very, very open to that type of thing. And they wanted to take care of these needy children. Well, no one had a quarrel about taking care of unfortunate situations of people homeless because of war and children without parents because of wars. Hearts go out and no one is hard-hearted. Nobody becomes an orphan hater. What happened in the 50s, and I've heard people say this myself, those people that are in the, and they used to call people aunties that were conservative in what we believe the Bible teaches. They would call us aunties and they say they hate orphans. Many people today think the Newton Church of Christ is made up of people who just hate orphans. But do you know what I have found out in my time in the church that there are more conservative Christians that have adopted orphans than there are in the liberal churches, institutional churches. Now we're not keeping score, but let no one say that anyone who believes what the Bible says about the care of orphans is heartless and hates orphans, because that's just a lie. It's not true. And there have been people that have uh, come over to Newton and worship with us from institutional churches. They said, we thought that you would stop us at the door and tell us we couldn't come in. I said, why, goodness, where'd you hear that? Well, that's what they told us. Well, you see, that's, that's dishonest. I, no one has ever done that. Matter of fact, the doors are still open, folks, <clears throat> at the Newton Church of Christ. For anyone that wants to discuss the divisions that are existing among different churches in this area, the door's still open. I was involved a few years ago with being asked to come to Fayetteville um, a gospel preacher and a friend of his had gotten together and they had gone and approached some, some people in different churches in the area and said, can we get together and at least talk about our, our, what divides us? And one man said yes and he tried to get some others to say yes and they said, we don't want to talk about it. Well, why would you not want to talk about uniting and doing what Acts 15 says and let's get together and see what the Bible says about the things that divide us. Friends, that's what we should do in all different groups. Where do we differ and how can we get together with it? Again, it has to be on the authority of God. Not an ecumenical agree to disagree and compromise, no. But let's find out how we can do away with the divisions. It's not good. God's people should be together. Well, in the 50s, things began to go downhill very quickly and churches divided. And I remember some of those divisions. And I remember my father being asked by a group of people that we love dearly. They said, Wiley, you can't teach the same gospel anymore. You're going to have to change what you're teaching or you're going to have to get out of the pulpit with us. My dad said, I'm not for sale. And I will continue to preach the whole counsel of God. And there were many people, and we had to leave because of that. Again, we left many friends behind. But you cannot compromise the truth. He still, for years, tried to get people to get together and talk about the divisions. They would not meet. But he is still willing. He's 94 years old, and he's still willing to meet with anybody who would want to discuss divisions that exist among the different churches. Well, that's the Bible pattern, friends. And that's the, that's the plea we make. If we differ, if there is a church on this corner and a church on that corner within blocks of one another, why can we not get together and talk about the issues that divide us? Matter of fact, the Newton Church of Christ has an open invitation to anybody in the area that is a member of the Church of Christ to come and let's talk about 
our differences. And let's see what the Bible says about the issues that divide us and let's find common ground in God's word by direct command, by approved apostolic example, by necessary inference and specific and generic commandments. Let's do that and let's be united. Let's have unity. Again, in all of these divisions that occurred during these years, the real issue, friend, was not do orphans need to be cared for. The issue was not are there things that we need to do in the area of evangelism that we're not doing in local churches? That was not it. It's do we need to get busy and do and work God's plan like, work, like God said to work it. Abuses did not prove the plan was wrong. Because people don't apply God's word doesn't mean God's word is untrue and we need to change it or customize it some way. That's the same trap in which the New Testament church fell from the beginning. Because something may seem to be reasonable, may seem to be a better way to do it, does not mean it is a better way to do it. What does the scripture say? Now divisions happened and exist even now. To where now we in the churches of Christ have been divided in many areas into what's called institutional churches and non-institutional churches. Again, the things that divide us are not should uh, people have recreation are not should people be involved in social activities or should we take care of the needy who has God authorized to do those things again no doubt that these things are good things to do no one would argue about that but how does God authorize it to be done that is the question where is the authority for the church out of its funds to involve itself in doing these duties. And where is the authority in the Bible for the individual doing these duties? Well, if there's authority for the individual, then the church doesn't take it on, does it? But if there's authority for the church, then the individual doesn't necessarily have to take it on. So again, let's, do, let's get together. Let's talk about what the Bible says. Let's study our Bibles together. Well, it all came down to a different approach to what the Bible says. And this goes back all the way into the Reformation movement. Is the Bible a, 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 a book of authority? Do we respect the silence of God as much as we respect the voice of God? If God does not speak specifically to an issue, are we okay in assuming that he means something? Well, there are two different ways to look at the Bible. And there are two different ways basically to look at society and politics and all kinds of things. And you have these words used in all types of things, especially today. We talk about liberal and conservative politicians, uh, liberal mindsets, conservative mindsets. We understand that. There are extremes in both, in both areas. Well, when God authorizes us to be liberal, you know it's scriptural to be liberal. Our liberality should be known to all people in our giving, shouldn't it? That our liberality is abundant, so God wants us to be liberal in that. But he doesn't want us to just go to the other end of the spectrum and be liberal in every idea we have. You see, and just accept anything and give anything. Well, what about conservatism? Does the Lord authorized conservatism? He surely does. When we realize that the way we walk, Jesus talked in the Sermon on the Mount, that it would be considered way too myopic for some people. It would be considered legalistic by some people. And Jesus warns us. He says, you know what? You're going to be hated of all people. When you stick to the pattern of sound words, you're going to be hated by people. Well, what do we do? Run from what God says? Can we be too conservative? Yes. Can we be too liberal? Yes, we can. So what are the symptoms of the problem? Well, in the, in these ideas with the division that occurred in the body of Christ began to grow, and it came out of an orphan's home issue. It came out of the situation of uh, what needed to be in the budget to colleges in the budget, putting the orphan's home in the budget, sponsoring churches for uh, smaller churches in communities that did not have elders, 
church recreation, fellowship halls, social meals, social gospel. Well, you see, the liberal mindset led to these things. Now, many people that were involved in the beginning stages of these things, did they had divisions among themselves over whether the college should be in the budget or whether a gymnasium should be there. And they, those things exist in this area even today. There are churches in this area. Some of them believe that a gymnasium is authorized and they can do that. And some of them said, oh no, but you can put, uh, you can send money to an orphan's home. Some will say, no, you can't have a sponsoring church, but you can have a fellowship hall. And you can have, you can feed people to come to church. And you can show uh, denominational uh, videos as your Bible class if you want to. And you can have a ball team, but you can't have a college. Well, you see, if you can do one thing without authority, friends, you can do all things without authority, can't you? So it comes back to a question of where is the authority? Now, the Newton Church of Christ is different from other churches of Christ because it holds to the pattern of sound words in the Bible so far. Could we fall away? Absolutely. Absolutely could happen. And we have to be constantly on guard with that. There is no authority in the Bible for the church support of human institutions. There is authority for individuals to support those, but none for the church to do so. The benevolent society, there's no authority for the church support of institutions. The local churches, the call came up is that all local churches can send money to a orphan's home and that orphan's home can take care of your orphans. And what you had was local churches sending money to an orphan's home to take care of orphans. Now the fact was, friends, the orphans that they were taking care of were not legitimate orphans in many cases. And by the way, you know it's awful hard to adopt an orphan from an orphan's home? You know that? Any of you that have tried to do that, I don't care what type of orphan's home it is, it's virtually impossible to do that. Well, churches began to do that. And they were well-meaning when they did that. And they said, they're going to care for the needy of the world that way. Well, what was wrong with that? Well, first of all, the Lord didn't authorize that. Did not authorize local churches to take care of the needy of the world. Now, should our hearts go out to the needy of the world? Absolutely. Galatians 6.10, James 1.27. Absolutely. We should care about the needy of the world. But it is not the local church's job to finance the needs of the, of, of the needy of the world. It's each individual Christian's job to do that. And we are to do that. We are to budget in our, in our finances. Money's to set aside for that purpose. Now, what's the problem? You've got a separate organization between the church and its work. Now, each local congregation is authorized to take care of the needs of an orphan or a widow in their midst, but you don't have authority to do that through a benevolent society if supported by churches. Well, again, the issue is not should orphans and others be helped. Or should the church help people who are in need? It should, but who and how, what mode or means or methods are authorized and what ones are not? Should a place be maintained to do that? Now let me ask you something. If, if I know you need $20, how's the best way for me to get you $20? Well, I hand it to you out of my wallet. I say, put it in your hand, right? And you have how much? You have $20. Now, you know what happened? Stewardship was, was violated in the methods in which people talked about. Here you had churches sending money to an in-between organization, and then that in-between organization was sending it to the individual. Well, what was happening? Well, they were sending $20 to the group, and the individual was getting 10 because of the overhead, you see? Because it costs to maintain these organizations. You see how God's plan works better? 
It's, a, it's in keeping with the stewardship principles found throughout the scripture by Jesus and others. Well, people said, you're going to let an orphan starve to death in the street before you'll take a penny out of the treasure to take care of No, we will not. Nobody ever said that. As a matter of fact, an orphan stand better chance of getting fed at the Newton Church of Christ than they would at other places. Because Christians at, at Newton, out of their own pocket, provide a lot of things that nobody ever knows about. And that's another thing. People were accusing people of not doing the work. When the Bible says specifically, don't do your alms to be seen of men. You know what? It's a very much a compliment for somebody to say, we don't know whether you do anything or not. Exactly. Now, if I don't do anything individually to care for the needs of people, that's on me and God. But don't you accuse me of not being able to help needy people. Because I'm not obligated by God to give you a list of every needy person I've ever helped. That would be in violation of God's will, actually. But that Christians are, individual Christians are charged with taking care of the needs of the world? Absolutely. Friends, the issue that divided is this. There's a separateness that God has authorized between what the church can do in the area of benevolence and what the work of the individual is. Okay? Who can the church legitimately help out of its treasury? A widow indeed. Okay? The church can take care of needs of the brethren and we were in um, both, we lived in both Florida and Texas on the coasts and we have, have been through storms where there are people all over the country that we know and that we were involved in as being some of those needy people at times where individual Christians without a human organization individual Christians help one another come through those things and churches when a church was devastated or washed out and everything it has was gone and they had depleted all their, all their monies to take care of their own members and they still had needs, you know what happened? The Bible authorizes churches to come to the aid of people in other congregations for a time period to take care of the needs that they have over and above what they can provide for themselves. And that, was, that, that is with the authority of the scripture. But you don't set up an organization that is ongoing to continue to do that. The need is taken care of, it's over. In Acts 6, 1 through 6, the widows, some of the widows there were neglected in the daily ministration there at Jerusalem, verse 1 of Acts chapter 6. The congregation selected seven men to specifically take care of that. The apostles appointed them. And those men's business was to care, making sure that all the widows in the congregation got cared for. Now, this happened, and when it happened, the local church was taking care of its own needy. That's the Bible pattern. What they didn't do was set up a separate organization between the church and the care for the needy in the congregation. They took care of it as a congregation. <coughs> all right, pardon me. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 16, here's the idea of a widow indeed. Who is the first obligation to take care of the widow indeed? Her family. Okay. Now the widow indeed must be a believing man, could be a widower or a woman. The church is authorized to relieve that widow. A Christian is authorized to relieve that widow. Her family has a specific obligation to take care of their own needy. If they can't do so, then they're to let it be known. There is no command, example, or inference to authorize the church to send money to a human organization to care for the needy. If so, where is the passage, friends? So there is no authority for the human church support of human institutions. There's no support for sponsoring churches. Local churches are not authorized to send money to a big church somewhere and that big church send, out, send the money out to a guy to preach the gospel or to another church to preach the gospel. The monies of the New Testament to support the preaching of the gospel went from local churches to the preacher, not to some sponsoring church. 
Now, there was a radio program that came out in, in the 50s and 60s called the Herald of Truth Broadcast. And what they said to local churches is we will receive your funds if you send it to our TV program, or our, I'm sorry, t it later became a TV program, but if you send it to our program, we'll take your funds and we'll send them to where we see a need. Now what happened with that? The local churches relinquished their control of the funds and where they went. Well, the local churches sent their money to a place called the Fifth and Highland Church in Abilene, Texas, which sponsored the Herald of Truth radio and TV program. Now let's bring that down to this venue. This is a TV program that is sponsored by the Newton Church of Christ. Suppose we sent across the country, across, we'll just say the, across the state of North Carolina, and we said if, you, if, if churches all over North Carolina will send money to the Newton Church of Christ, we will decide where we send it and what we do with it. What's wrong with that? You give up the control of your money. You're out of the local congregation autonomy. Okay. Plus, it is without the authority of God to do that. So there is no authority in the scriptures for that. <coughs> Pardon me again. Now, what's the issue? The issue is not, does the gospel need to be preached? The issue is not, can you use a radio or a TV program to do that? Obviously, we think it's scriptural or we wouldn't do it. Is good being done by the teaching of the gospel in these venues? Yes, it's not the issue. So, can churches ever cooperate to do things? Pardon me. <coughs> Pardon me again, I'm so sorry. Can churches cooperate to do, to do the work of teaching the gospel? Yes, they can do that. It's a matter of how it's done. That's how it's done. Well, could we use a preacher on this program from another congregation? We've done that. Does that mean that we relinquish control of what we're doing to that preacher and where he is? No, it does not. The issue is, can church A send money to church B to preach the gospel? When they are perfectly capable of doing it themselves. See? The issue is, can multiple churches work through one eldership? That's an issue. Well, God's pattern for the New Testament church is this. What the church can do in evangelism is send a preacher to preach the gospel. The church at Newton has helped support me and as I've continued to go to different places to preach the gospel, they've continued my support as I've gone around. In that sense, they have had fellowship with me in the preaching of the gospel as I've gone around and preached in meetings, different places. Well, the, uh, the church can also send to a preacher to pay him to preach the gospel and support him and his family wherever he is. Philippians 4 and verse 15 would authorize that. One church can send to another church in the work of benevolence. If there is a need far and above, Acts 11, 27 and following, where a church has needs far and above what it can supply, other churches can send for a particular period of time till the need is taken care of, and then the need is taken care of, it's over. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> just a few years ago, you remember when everything hit the, uh, the area of uh, the coastal area of Texas pretty bad? And there were people that had gotten water in their house that had never gotten water in their house. Terrible flooding. People lost everything they had. Well, do you want to know the story about that, folks? There were brethren that, that sent out lists of people that were suffering after they had done everything they could to help them. <clears throat> after the insurance had come in, after all those things. And do you know that to my knowledge, every one of those needs has been taken care of? I know for a fact the ones I knew about have been taken care of and then more. And there were churches that said, please don't send us anything else. We are taken care of. Thank you very much for that. 
God's plan works, folks. And that was without any human organization being set up. Isn't that amazing? Not really. That's God and his plan working. And we dare not go away from God's perfect plan and try to manufacture one of our own. There's no Bible authority for sponsoring churches. The elders' oversight of a congregation is limited to local congregations. That's it. There is no authority for elders having any more oversight than just the local congregation. That's it. 1 Peter 5 and Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. There's no command, example, or inference for the church, one church to send money to another church to preach the gospel. You can send money to a preacher to preach the gospel, but not to the church to preach the gospel. And if there is authority to send money to a church to preach the gospel for you, tell me where that passage is. Again, there's no authority for a social gospel. Where in the Bible <clears throat> do you find authority for church kitchens or fellowship halls or ball teams or recreation programs or daycare centers or gimmicks to draw crowds and so on? Bluegrass for Jesus. There's no authority in the scripture for that. Now, I like bluegrass music, but there's no authority for the Bible in the Bible for us to use that to draw people in to hear about the Lord. The church is not a social organization. The gospel is not a social gospel. It's the message of Christ to save men's souls from sin. It's a spiritual message and it has a spiritual application. Eating in the building. Some people say, well, you know, you, you wouldn't eat a cough drop down there at the Newton Church of Christ. Well, that's not true. <laughs> not true at all. And a baby comes, a baby has to have milk. That's food, isn't it? Well, okay. What do we tell everybody when they come? Well, if your baby's hungry, you need to leave. No, we don't tell them that. You see how ridiculous it gets sometimes when people are divisive by nature? And they want to spread stories to continue to divide? Let's just back off here a minute, folks, and let's just recognize that we're all trying to go to heaven. And we need to go to heaven by God's arrangement, not by what we think. And we don't need to lie about one another, about what we practice. Many people have no idea what's practiced because they won't come to gospel meetings. They won't, they won't discuss differences. They just assume. Now the issue is not, is the building a sacred place? It's not the temple. Or can one eat something inside a church building? Or can one eat something on church property? Heard people say you can't even chew a stick of gum on the Newton Church of Christ parking lot. Well, that's just a lie. That's just not true. Again, don't say things that are not true. There's a penalty for that. The issue is, and was, and still continues to be, can the church have a common social meal for recreational and social purposes? Can that happen? We're not talking about an incidental use. When people say, well, you have a water fountain, so you've got a concession. No, we do not. We got water in our baptistry. We could take a cup and pour it out of there if we wanted to. But at the laws of the land say if you have a structure where people are gathered, you've got to have a way to, to, to put something there in their mouth when they get thirsty or cough, like I'm doing tonight, so they have something to drink. You've got to do that to meet in a, in a local area. Well, okay. Now, <clears throat> that's an incidental thing. That is not being built. We didn't say, well, let's build a building and let's, let's ask people to come so they can drink out of our water fountain. That's just ridiculous, isn't it? And nobody does that. Or let's have, uh, let's build a church building and, and have a commode in it so people will come to use our bathroom. No, that's ridiculous. Or let's put a baptistry in so people will come to see our baptistry. No. You see, that is absolutely ridiculous. And nobody makes those arguments that I know of. The work of the local church. What is it? Let's go back to it. 1 Timothy 3.15, evangelism. Ephesians 4.16, edification. 1 Timothy 5.16, limited benevolence. But where is the passage? 
find it. Because honestly, we could do away with a lot of division if there was a passage that says you can have a ball team. You can have a playground in your parking lot. You can have a bouncy house. You can, you can have a, a bluegrass for Jesus. You can have barbecue dinners, ice cream dinners. Oh my, I like ice cream. But I tell you what, there's no place in the Lord's body, in the church, for us to sponsor a concession stand that, has, that feeds the hungry of the world so we'll be able to talk to them a little bit about Jesus. People come to church services, folks. They need to hear about the Lord. They don't need to feed their face. Especially, they're not needy. We're not talking about a needy situation. We're talking about people just coming and drawing them in with an ice cream cone or a hot dog. Well, as long as you have hot dogs and ice cream, they'll keep coming. But when your ice cream is not as good as the one down the road, or your hot dogs play out, so does your crowd. And Jesus knew that from John chapter 6. You know, there's a time when he fed the 5,000, when it was incidental to his teaching. They came to hear the gospel. They came to hear what he was teaching. And as a result of them being there, the time passed by and they it came time to eat and they were hungry. So Jesus fed them. But what happened after that was people began to follow Jesus for what? To try to see one of his tricks. See. Or to just see if he could feed them like he fed those others. And what did Jesus do? He refused to feed them. Because they were following him because their bellies were getting full. Now, friends, I'll tell you what, if we advertise at the Newton Church of Christ, I came on the TV program here tonight, said, guess what, at the Newton Church of Christ, we're going to give everybody a sirloin, an eight-ounce sirloin steak if you come down there and come to church with us. Oh, you couldn't, the parking lot would be full. But you know what, the steak would play out. We couldn't do that every week. And so you know what would happen? The crowds would go away. Because people won't, would not be coming to hear the gospel. They'd be coming to eat steak. So you see the gimmicks of the world, people trying to plan a better plan than God planned, just won't work. Now, I'll tell you what, if somebody comes to worship services and I decide afterwards, me and my wife decide afterwards that we'll take them out to eat and talk to them about the Lord on an individual basis, or if I, we have some people over to our house and have a meal at our house for something, that's called hospitality, folks, and that is the work of the individual, but not the work of the church. There is no command, example, or inference that authorizes the church to arrange or support a common meal for social and recreational purposes. Where is the passage in the Bible that does that? Well, there's no authority in the Bible to tolerate that which is intolerable. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, churches have to deal with sin in their midst. Okay? So how do we do that? How do we deal with sin in a congregation? Well, some people tolerate it. Some people say, okay, let's just give up the fight on modesty and let's, be, let's let people come in bikinis or for that matter, let's just let them come however they want to come, clothed or not clothed. No, can't do that because the Bible speaks to the subject of modesty. Let's just give up the whole picture of the modern dance. Friends, you've been to a football game lately and see what the cheerleaders are wearing and what they're doing and how the dance team goes on the field and what they're doing. Where my wife worked in a, in a school in Florida one time, the principal called in the cheerleading coach and called in the dance team coach and called in the band director. He said, I want to tell you something. He was a religious man. He said, this is absolutely getting obscene. He said, if you, get the, if you will not put a, put a stop to some of this, I will. And he said, this immodesty that's going on out there and this dancing, which is nothing, was just, just one step below the pole dancing at the local strip joint. He said, I want to tell you something. If that keeps up, there will be no dance team and there will be no uh, cheerleaders and no majorettes. And this was a man that was 
Not a person that you would say, well, this is a really religious guy. But he had had enough of it. And he saw the seductiveness of what was happening in the worldliness involved. And he said, enough. That's it. And he had a right to do that as the principal of the school. But you know, we have some of my brethren that are not even willing to take a stand against these things. And it's continuing to divide brethren. Adultery. Whenever I preach on these subjects right here and on social drinking, I tell my wife, pack, pack up a box because we're getting ready to move. Because you know what? There's some brethren get really ticked at you for preaching about these things. But as long as I'm preaching, as long as I have life in me, I'll continue to preach on these things, folks, because it's the truth. And they need to be heard. Do you know that in religious groups a few years ago, as little as 20 to 30 years ago, there was a common ground that we found on immodesty and dancing and gambling and adultery and divorce and remarriage and on the idea of denominationalism even in the body of Christ. But you know what? Even in the body of Christ, these things are dividing. And that is absolutely sad. What that says is Satan's making headway in local churches around the country and in the lives of many Christians that are just eaten up with worldliness and they want to find a way to justify it. Well, friends, we can't have that because we must maintain the pattern of Scripture. There's a spirit among many Christians today that is progressive, that is all about grace and love, and, has, and, don't, and they want to just totally eliminate works and obedience and legalism, as they put it. And there's, they're going to want more and more about grace and love and less and less about the issues. Let's talk to the heart and let's deal with the application of the changed heart. Well, friends, when you start hearing that type of talk, there's some problems in the lives of the people. And there will be problems in the church when that takes place. Well, tolerant spirits for unfaithfulness. Nope, can't have that. Well, again, this is the plan of salvation, friends. Have you done this, these things? Have you done what Jesus said? All of these passages are things that Jesus said in authorizing these things to save you. Have you done them? Remember our gospel meeting that's going to be taking place with Alex Caldwell <clears throat> and July the, or June the 14th through the 16th. And again, uh, uh, you can call in tonight or you can go onto our website and you can find on our Facebook page, you'll find this announcement up there. And we urge you to do that. Invite your friends to come. Brother Caldwell is, is a good gospel preacher. He's also a dynamic gospel preacher. He has a tremendous ability in a special way to present God's Word. Without taking away from the Word, he is able to do it effectively. And we think that you'll enjoy coming to hear Brother Caldwell preach the gospel, but the thing you come for is not because Brother Caldwell has ability. You come to hear the truth, and he will present it in a very capable and able form without getting in the way of the message. Well, we invite you to attend with us at the, at the Newton Church of Christ meeting at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton. Times are 9.30 and 11 and then 7 o'clock and you come be with us. Our next program will be in June. Uh, we'll be coming to you in June. And you can contact us by uh, going to P.O. Box 893 at Newton, North Carolina, 28658. Call, contact us by phone at the building at 828-465-3009 or by going by email to contact at wordandsword.com. Okay, next program is going to be on June the 4th. Boy, the summer's here, isn't it? So we urge you to, to uh, come to our gospel meeting, and we urge you to be involved with us as we take our survey. Some of you may not have been here at the beginning of the program. We're taking a word and sword uh, religious survey, and one of the things I want to talk to you about is an article as we are ending our program tonight. We want you to think about this. Did you know that liberal denominationalism is dying throughout this country. There's a book that was recently written by a man named, uh, a, a reporter 
for the Washington Post and the Weekly Standard and the National Review and the Wall Street Journal. And he has written a book called The Exodus, Why Americans Are Fleeing the Liberal Churches for Conservative Christianity. And he makes this statement, liberal Christianity is fast imploding upon itself. He opens the book with this, with a presentation of a young man that has gone to a religious seminary to become a preacher. His fellow students come to him when he feels conflicted about what he's being taught and they say, we have figured out your problem. You seem to always be at odds with everyone else. Your problem, little freshman, is that you're really the only one on this campus that believes in God. This was from a, and this is a quote, from a young man who was in a religious seminary to become a preacher for a denomination. And the students said, you're the only one here that still believes in God. I have told many young men that have talked about going to seminaries, you be careful. And my advice to you is don't go. Because you can be affected, you can lose your faith there. And undermine, your faith will be undermined. Attempts will be made to get you to stop believing in God, to have doubts about the deity of Jesus, to stop believing in the miracles of the Bible, and to eventually come to the point where the Bible is not the inspired word of God verbally. It's just a book of suggestions. And do you know what seminaries are training young men to be? Not preachers of the Bible, they're training them to be community organizers. Several years ago in a town in Alabama, I was talking with a Methodist preacher. We were pretty good friends. And I said, Tom, I said, let me ask you something. What do you believe about baptism? He said, oh, I believe you need to be baptized to be saved. And I've done that, he said. I said, well, do you preach that at the Methodist church? He said, oh, no, I don't preach that. I said, why? He said, because I'd be fired and I'd lose my support and then I'd have to get another job. And I said, do you, have, do you believe that's what the Bible teaches, but you won't teach it? He said, no, because he says doctrine is a personal thing, you see, and the real job of churches, and my job as a preacher, is not to decide everybody's doctrine for them. My job as a preacher is to help the community be a better place. And that was years ago, that was back in the late 70s. Friends, we've got a whole lot of changes that have happened. We asked the question in our survey, this is the question, call in and give our operators your answer. Is the church where you're going losing members? And if it is, why? And I'm going to read you some statistics here. Americans are vacating progressive pews and flocking to churches that offer more traditional views of Christianity. He says most people go to church to get something spiritual. They don't go to get something they can get anywhere. And when they are getting something they can get anywhere, anywhere always does it better than religious people. Isn't that quite a statement? They want the good news of the gospel. And what they're getting are political views, intellectual coaching, and what the result is empty pews in droves. The statistics tell the story. While liberal churches and denominations are following a pattern that will lead to their own destruction. There may now be twice as many lesbians in the United States as there are Episcopalians. Citing a study published in 2000 by the Glen Mary Research Center, the author says the Presbyterian Church USA declined by 11.6% over the previous decade. The United Methodist Church, 6.7%. The Episcopal Church lost 5.3%. The United Church of Christ was abandoned by 15% of its membership. 
most conservative denominations are growing, it says. The conservative Presbyterian Church grew 42%, but the more liberal Presbyterian denomination lost 14%. Okay. Liberal groups like the Missionary Alliance lost 22% of their members over a 10 year period. Well, friends, this, these are statistics from someone that I don't even agree with. He didn't have an agenda at all. What he's saying is what we've been talking about tonight. The liberal mindset is destroying the religion of Christ. And what has happened, particularly, he is, he is an Episcopalian, and what has happened, and he talks about his own church. He said in the liberal Episcopalian church, when they started ordaining, um, openly practicing marriage, gay marriage men to bishops in the Episcopalian church, that was the nail that on the coffin to many Episcopalians. And they said, that's it. The Bible does not teach that that's all right. And do you know that that was against at that time the Episcopalian doctrine? And they did nothing about it. They just winked at it and walked away. The social agendas of the country are being the standard by which many churches are walking. And they are losing substantial members. Friends, I'm, I think I'm talking to some, some of you tonight that are just about done with the groups you're with because of such things as what we've talked about. More and more openness to sinful things and saying it's okay and we have to accept everybody and nobody can be wrong and everybody's right and there is no standard and we can't really be judgmental and all those types of things. Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross because he pleased everybody, did he? People hated him for teaching a standard. They hated him, and they still do. And folks, people are wanting in religious groups, and this has been observed by many people. One of the largest problems in our society, in our country, is that we have become so tolerant of everything, and we accept anything. And the idea that since we have freedom of religion, that opens the door for the acceptance and the toleration of any type of idea that is out there. While we have freedoms politically that we all cherish, let's make sure that we don't bring that into the groups that we are, are involved in and in teaching. And again, what we've talked about is unity on the Bible. You know what, if everybody would come back to the Bible standard, we would settle, settle about 90 to 100 percent of the church of the, of the issues of society because the Bible is the remedy friends. It's God's Word. It's His rule book. It's how we have proper unity. It's how we have proper spiritual communion, communion with God. Not by everyone believing in a different God and us saying, oh that's okay. Let's have that fellow over there that believes in Buddha. Let's have him come preach for us Sunday. No, 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 no. Not if you claim to believe in the one God. You don't do, it, do people any favor by making them think that, that Muhammad was, a, was, was the same as Jesus. You don't do that. That's no favor. The Bible message is there is no one but Jesus. John 14, 6, no man comes to the Father but by Christ. And that's just about as clear as it gets, isn't it? Again, because our society gives us a, a, a license to accept all people from everywhere, let's not say, well, what are we supposed to do? Let them come in with their error and let it be the dominant thing for us? Somebody says, oh, that'll never happen. Do you know Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world? And it is the fastest growing religion in the United States. And rather than teach them out of Islam belief, what we are doing as a society is we're adopting what they believe. Well, ask yourself, is that the way to heaven? 
Is that the way to be in a righteous nation? Righteousness, friends, according to the proverb writer, exalts a nation. And sin, there has to be such a thing as sin, is a reproach to any people. Friends, if you want the truth, if you want something that is conservative, that is based upon the Bible, and the Bible alone, where book, chapter, and verse teaching is sought and honored, when you come and study with the people that are called themselves Christians, that meet in congregations called the Church of Christ, and you'll find conservative viewpoints about the Bible. And we're not that way because it's politically correct. We're that way because it's biblically correct. And there is a book, chapter, and verse answer for the things that we practice in religion. You're looking for that old time religion. You go all the way back to Jerusalem, folks. All the way back there. We don't stop short. We don't bass, bass go or anything. We just go right back to the Bible. And that's the standard. And friends, there was an appeal made many years ago to people in religious denominations saying, let's, let's throw away everything. All the creed books, all the man-made names, all the, the theologies, and let's just go back to the Bible. And let's take the Bible as our standard. When we do that, and we do it properly, and we rightly divide the Word of God, we have a scripture that leads us unto all things. It is able to be the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. And all scripture is inspired of God. It's not a suggestion. It's not a man's opinion. It's the Bible. It's the word of God. And you can believe it and obey it and go to heaven. The whole story of what the Lord thinks of you cherishes you, he values you, and he doesn't want you to be lost. Come be with us in our gospel meeting coming up. Come be with us anytime that we meet. And we would be glad to discuss these things and others with you from the Bible. Please pardon me for my coughing tonight. Hopefully I'll be over that next time. Come be with us, and good evening. <laughs>